I'm a little bit grim. I'm a right advocate. I work for one of our free meal center. I'm also uh, the chair for, for example. For local, um, black, um, meaning that that's the fairest option we put on every call every month is I wear many different. Different ads and the advocacy world. But I'll tell you a little bit more a little later. Kick it on. Okay. So I'm I'm gonna begin first. Um uh, uh, and uh what I wanna go through a little bit before we go through this is a little bit about the history of the Latterman Act. And this is more than just a uh, uh, a nice thing to do. The part of what I want you to get out of this when we're all done is where did the Latterman Act come from and where is it going, okay? And one thing about this is the Latterman Act is very unique. It's the only entitlement program in California, in the United States. And the title that mean as we're going to go through uh, here as we go through this is uh, uh, something you have a right to rather than just a nice thing to do. Part of as we go through this is not only where did it come from but and where is it going, but, but also the importance of the IPP. And then from the whole process that's set up, and this is part of what uh, Liz and uh, Sheridan are going to do is that in order to carry out the mandate of the of the Lanterman Act, which is our civil rights program for persons with disabilities, uh, we have all these different players involved. We got state councils, we got regional centers, we got uh, we got vendors, we got all sorts of stuff. I know for a lot of folks, uh, and this is one of the advantages of a transition fair. Uh, you know, being a parent of a child with a disability is kind of like going to a university where you never graduate, okay, uh, here. And uh, and by the way, they keep changing the rules and modifying them. So let me go through this as quick as I can. Uh, other thing with this, this program, you're going to see two very short clips, depending on how much time I have and how much babbling I do up here. But what this is, is a program was that was developed about 15 years ago. It's now on video. Uh, I am also the trustee of the Golden State Pool Trust, and I'm on the board of the Arc of California, and the Arc of California and the Golden State Pool Trust have taken this training and have put it online. So you're going to get a taste of it, but uh, part of this training is available. Part one has to do with IPPs. Part two have to do with uh, advocacy and information organizations, and part three is going to have to do with vendor organizations. Did I mention this is like going to a college where you never graduate, right? I, You just go from phase to phase to phase, and you're going through a big phase. So the history of this is that it's we are the only state that has an entitlement um, here, um, and it was signed into 19, into, um, uh, uh, in law in 1969. Now, if you actually listen to all of Chad's piece, the recording, he's going to go through that a lot of people think the entitlement began afterwards. No, it actually started in 1969. I was in high school uh, at the time. It was driven by parents. Where did this come from? Okay. And you guys may be lucky because I don't have time to talk about my own history, which I find it uh, um, fascinating. But I actually worked in state hospitals from 1970 until uh, the late 80s. And part of this was a lot of, um, um, part of this was a 
uh, a problem that the hospitals could no longer really meet the needs of the community. And, uh, and instead of expanding the hospitals, um, the Lannerman Act was put together to move those services into the community rather than in large institutions. I will tell you one thing about institutions, whether you're talking about state hospitals, Lannerman Act or whatever, is that you know part of this is in order to have programs that are going to continue on and provide this long term, you must always um, uh, you must always advocate for these services, and this is part of what you're going to look at because um, community services can fall apart just like the state hospitals uh, fell apart, and then the problem with that is that we have people with disabilities who suffer from that. Uh, these these are rights we can't take for granted. And this is why this is so important. You're gonna hear a big pitch coming up uh, here, but since you're in a transition fair, I'm going to assume that you are invested in this community or you wouldn't be spending a Saturday afternoon here. And there is a need for continued advocacy. Next slide, please. Okay, so just a little brief history uh, here and we're gonna make this as brief as we can. Uh, next slide. Okay, so. Part of what you're going to get is a link to a YouTube channel where there is a playlist. You'll notice on the side here, there's all these different uh, videos. These are videos on different components of things that uh, we believe that you should understand or have access to, to be able to understand how to fully implement the services. And once again, it is not an easy system, but we've got family resource centers, we've got schools, we've got regional centers, we've got all these different things. And part of this is to try to help families and persons with disabilities make some sense out of all of this. Next slide. Okay, so once again, just going through this quickly, in 1950, uh, here is, and there is the R word that was very common back then. We don't use the R word anymore. But where did the ARC and other programs came, come from? And they came from parents like you who were asking, is there a different way of doing this? Next slide. Okay, in 1963, once again, a big push was that the state hospitals, both the uh, what we call developmental centers now and the programs for, mental, for uh, persons with mental illness uh, here, were having severe problems and not being able to meet their mandate and we're having more and more problems as time goes on. There was a big push to expand the hospital system uh, here. Um, and it kind of became a battle between the, uh, the employees and the parents and the parents won, okay? And so a lot of those uh, programs, and it took decades to do this, moved into the community under this new model. Next slide, please. Okay, so out of that, of course, we got to have law. So uh, the first law that came out, AB uh, 691, these regional center things, you, you wonder where the hell these things come from? The original ones, there was one in San Francisco and one in Los Angeles. And they were basically, they tinkered with that for a while um, here, trying to refine how is this going to work? I mean, they just, they they that's one thing. This was a very innovative program. They weren't copying another state. They just made it up themselves. They, most of those at those points, the regional centers did something very different at the, that point. They focused a lot more on folks with medical needs and that kind of thing. And the folks we serve were a little bit more um, uh, restricted than what we see today. Next slide, please. So once again, uh, the Lannerman Act was signed in 1969 by Ronald Reagan. Okay, now I just want to tell you uh, that we're not here for a political talk. I happen to be a Democrat, but I have to tell you, a lot of the major uh, civil rights programs for disabled folks were signed by Republicans. I mean, that just kind of shows this is something that affects everything. Okay, uh, here. So, uh, so it was signed in 1969. And once again, Senator Short, uh, uh, was key in doing this uh, here, along with a follower named uh, Frank Latterman. Next slide, please. In 1973, once again, was when the big expansion began because then they started to expand who they were going to serve. So 
So they included folks with autism or folks in the spectrum, folks with cerebral palsy, epilepsy, and other neurological diseases up here. And the fifth category, because sometimes it's hard to define what the disability is. So there is this magic fifth um, uh, category, which is really more for folks that are functionally um, developmentally disabled and have a need, but they don't fit into a nice neat, neat little box. And a lot of folks with disabilities don't fit into a nice neat little box. Do they live? No. no, it would be easier if they did, but they don't. Okay, so they don't. So, so. Yeah, that's right. So, oh, okay. And no matter how much I hit this, um, 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 this clicker, it's not going to go forward. So it go uh, next one. 1977 once again uh, created the Department of Developmental Services, which is the big state agency that oversees regional centers. And developmental centers as things grew. Next slide. Up uh, here. So regional centers. Okay. And, and we're going to touch on this, but regional centers are very unique. Okay. You go to Col Colorado and go ask them where your local regional center is. They'll say it's back here in California. They don't have regional centers. Okay. So they, they are nonprofit. Okay. How many of you have ever been to a regional center meeting? Fascinating thing to do, I'm honest to God, it is. I mean, it is a nonprofit, and I really would suggest uh, okay. that it's a good thing to go to to get some idea about what the heck this is, who's running it, and you know what you're going to see? You're going to see a board with parents and persons with disabilities, okay? A lot of people think of regional centers as these things where it is like the state telling me what to do. These are actually people that are invested in the community. They have community boards up here. They're not state agencies. The original plan was to have one regional center per million dollar, a million uh, in population. It didn't really work out that way. Uh, so once again, we have some regional centers that have uh, are much larger than others and all that. What the regional center does, or at least for I stand in, is we're going to talk about is there it's a thing called the IPP. And as we're going to see, if it's not in the IPP, it doesn't exist. So part of it is you put the plan together, but then who's going to carry out the plan? And part of what the regional center does is it works with different vendors, like EBI is a vendor, okay? So it might mean that you need services, then they need to uh, uh, find a contractor that'll do it. The regional center contracts annually with the Department of Developmental Center Services here. And they, they overall, they do intake, case management, and uh, overlook quality services. Really, in a way, for the regional center to do what it needs to do, it needs participation from folks that are stakeholders, that is, folks with disabilities and families. And without that, you know, we're not meeting... Uh, the promise of the Lanterman Act. Next slide, please. So in 1982, could you imagine this? We had a recession, right? So, you know, uh, economic si uh, system, um, you know, we have our, our bull markets and our bear markets and that kind of thing, and we're not in a bull market right now, is that it had a deficit. And it had 11 million dollar deficit now in today's budget man that's a rounding error right but you know back then that was a chunk of money and the regional center as we're going to see in a minute from a little clip that um um sure it's going to try to play for you and see if it's going to work uh they said well we can't meet our mandate and we're going to start cutting services so they started living uh um, limiting services and that kind of thing and they limited what you could purchase from the regional centers and the Ark of California up uh, here uh, sued the state of California, it took a number of years and that kind of thing. And we're going to talk about that. Next slide, please. So, um, Sheridan, let's, let's, this is the most hazardous part of my presentation. Can you play the video clip, please? Yes, hang on one second. Okay. And it probably will have five seconds of God knows what they're going to try to say. And this is Chad's, Chad's bit, right? Chad's bit. Yep, hang on one moment. We will certainly okay. do that. Well, she's okay. 
requirements. They do not have the discretion to not meet a need that is set forth in the IPP. Uh, the state does not have the ability to uh, define the substance of what can and can't, should and shouldn't be in those IPPs. That's a matter for the planning team to decide. Now the court did say when the money runs out, uh, the department obviously cannot continue to fund services you know, indefinitely beyond what's allocated to them. But what the court said the uh, department needs to do is to go back to the legislature. And the remedy is with the legislature. The department has an obligation to report back to the legislature. We are not able to meet all of our consumers' needs under the entitlement because we have not been granted enough resources then the critical decision has to be made by the legislature. Do they allocate more funds so that the entitlement can be fully realized, or do they legislatively change the scope of the entitlement to reduce the amount of services that are being provided? They can only do so by changing the Lanterman Act. Uh, and uh, one could argue that that's in fact what has happened over the last 20 years. There's been a series of rate freezes. There's been a series of uh, changes made to the Lanterman Act that you could argue are in fact legislative changes that chip away at that entitlement. Things like uh, recreation and camp services that were not available for quite a, an extended period of time because the legislature made changes to the Lanterman Act. Uh, rate caps, rate freezes that uh, prevented uh, consumers from receiving the services that they need that, that prevented providers from being able to attract and retain qualified staff and adequate staff to cover their needs uh, and to meet the ratios and objectives that they're required to and that they needed to to provide good services. So it's very important as advocates, as family members, uh, as consumers, that we pay attention to what's going on every year in Sacramento what the contents are of those budget trailer bills that make substantive changes to the Lanterman Act. That is the only way, according to the Supreme Court's decision, that the entitlement can be changed, altered, reduced, enlarged, or done away with completely. So when those changes are made, we need to be paying attention. We need to know that they're coming so that we can tell the legislature uh, what sorts of impacts those changes are going to have and if those changes are made, uh, either over our objection or without us noticing, we have to go back and hold them accountable and say, these are the changes you made last year. This is what's happened to my family member as a result. This is what's happened to the day program that my uh, family member went to for 20 years and is now is closing their doors. Um, so these things are important. They matter. That's why it's important to pay attention to what's going on in Sacramento. And if we want to preserve and protect the entitlement, uh, and even enlarge the scope of the entitlement. The, the only way to do that is through the legislature. So we have to make sure that we understand what's going on, that the legislature understand what's going on, and that parents and advocates and family members and consumers continue to have a voice in the process of uh, recognizing, celebrating, and uh, protecting and maintaining that entitlement. Okay. If you wanna learn more about how the IPP process works, Okay, and many more wise words. We're just getting a clip. So part of this is what is this telling us? And I have to tell you, um, you guys opened up your email. Aren't you constantly getting a write your legislator for this, write your legislator for that, all of that? And sometimes we get advocacy fatigue, but we are the only state, the only state with an entitlement without waiting lists. If you go to Colorado, they'll say, happy to have you here. Put your name on a waiting list and we'll get to you eventually, right? And that's what we're trying not to have. So the issue with this is, if you understand the entire process, and so that's part of this Keep the Letterman Promise series that's available to you at no cost uh, here is to understand the, not only how to use the IPP, but the importance of it, because here's the deal. I get this question all the time as an attorney about how much should I set aside in my child's special needs trust to make sure that we can incorporate enough for their quality of life? The answer is, how in the hell could I possibly know? But I do know this, okay? 
I know that systems, including uh, uh, community systems and including state hospitals and all of them, is that they have their cycles. And when they become underfunded uh, here and, and the work is not quality, then they fall apart and we have to do this all again. If the regional center system were to fail, the amount of money you need to supplement for that is an astronomical amount. When the regional center is doing its job the way it's supposed to do, which is a promise between families and persons with disabilities to be able to provide those quality services, as long as we have the resources to do that, there's no reason why this uh, program, this, this system can't go on forever. So let's just go to the next slide and let me finish up a few other things and then we'll turn this over to this. IPPs, the role of the regional center. I know sometimes it seems like the regional center is their only job is to be there to make your job even a little bit more miserable. That's not what it's all about. The role of the regional center is to assess the need and figure out how to fill it. I mean, that's basically how to do this. And it's, a, it's an important process that we have to go through. Next slide, please. So under the, well, I'm an attorney, so we gotta, we gotta have codes. So under that, there's a thing called the planning team, okay? And so this is another thing to learn more about what is a planning team and how does it work? And part of this is it's always centered on the person. Now, there are many cases, maybe with our person with disability, where they're able to, you know, um, to advocate their own needs, and maybe they don't want or don't need a lot of help. There's a lot of folks where it really is more of a family process. That's the, something we're working with. So part of that is through the planning team, which is focused on the individual here, and part of this is working with the regional center and the service coordinator to assess what those needs are and figure out how we're gonna do it. Next slide. So um, we'll take this one um, other clip real quick and just for a moment up uh, here, but just as, as, as Sheridan's queuing that up, part of what's really important is this is why you need to really understand the IPP system. Because here's the message. If it's not in the IPP, it doesn't exist, much like an IEP for school, okay? If it is in the IPP, part of what the video here, if you watch the entire thing goes through, is how do you make sure that not only if it's in your IPP, but how do you make sure it actually happens? Sheridan, if you can just play a couple more minutes, and then I'll pass this off to you. Um, thanks, Steve, and thanks, Chad, for that uh, summary of the history of the Lanterman Act. My name is Pat Hornbecker, and this is Kim, both parents of a son with developmental disabilities. Joseph has Angelman syndrome. He's 41 years old. So I've been working with these services for a very long time, and it's important for families to understand this, and that's why we're doing it. Today, we're here to talk about the entitlement called the Lanterman Act and the IPP process, how to write it, how to get it, how to fight it, how to make it successful. So let's start with the entitlement. The entitlement is unique to California in that it is a right for people with developmental disabilities to be provided the services and supports that they need. It is also an obligation of the state to provide these services. This is a promise. This is a contract with the people with uh, disabilities in the state of California and their families to make sure that they get the services they need. Now to do this, you actually have to know some of the players in this team. There are the people with disabilities and their families. There are regional centers across the state, and there are, is the Development Department of Developmental Services in Sacramento. There are also lots of providers across the state that help provide these services, and we'll show you how they factor in to this process as we go through. But remember, California is the only state that has this entitlement, this promise to people with disabilities. 
The IPP, which is the individual program plan, is very important because it's a document. It is a legal document that guarantees the services you should be receiving. It is through this IPP process that the rights are of this act are granted to the individuals with developmental disabilities. And then California and the Department of Developmental Services is obliged to implement this plan. So the process itself defines the services. And we do this through meetings. And usually at the regional center, now we do everything by Zoom. So a regional center will be assigned, is in your area. There are 21 regional centers across the state. And I work with Golden Gate Regional Center in the San Francisco Bay Area. Regional centers assess needs and they lead the IPP process and they deliver services, sometimes in-house and sometimes through vendors, also through a number of other ways, which we'll get into when we get into the nitty gritty of actually how to write an IPP. Parents and consumers can be involved in the local regional centers because they are a nonprofit with boards and they often have parents and consumers who are involved in their boards. The trick of the IPP and writing the IPP is making sure you get all of the services you need into that document that we're talking and about. And we could go on and on, but I just want to give you a flavor of this, uh, Sharon, if we can pause at this point. So once again, we'll go through this real quick. You know, part of this is this program goes through bit by bit by bit, quite frankly, in painful detail, but you know, it's required in this situation uh, here uh, about how the process works and how do we take those choices and turn them into action. Next slide, please. Oh. So once again, part of this with the IPP, the individual program plan is, you know, once again, there, there, the more you understand the process, the more effective an advocate you're going to be, whether you're a consumer or a family member. And um, and I'll just say, we're, so that I can move along a little bit, part of this is the more you understand this, the more effective you're going to be. Uh, here, let's go to the next slide, Sheridan. Because um, I'm, I'm about ready. Um, so once again, Part of this is these decisions are made in this process. And if it's not part of the IPP, there's no guarantee that thing is going uh, to happen. And so this has to be done by agreement. And part of as you watch this with an actual decision maker in the room, we are not buying a car. So it's not like I'm going to go back to my manager and get back to you. If that's what's going on, part of what uh, this training tells you is stop stop the process and wait until you get a decision maker in the room because uh, once again, that's what this whole process is all about. Let's just go to the next slide um, here. Um, and once again, uh, this is very typical for me, I jumped ahead, but you wanna make sure there is a decision maker in the room. And once again, that's part of what this training helps us with. Next slide, please. So once again, let me just make this pitch. Now, this isn't in my best interest. I happen to be an attorney and I make my living because uh, with systems that are dysfunctional. And I have to tell you, my living is really good. But, you know, once again, you don't want to you don't want to give me too much work here. Part of this to make this work is one, we've got to make sure that what the regional centers are doing are relevant to our disabled loved one's life and the family support with that sort of thing. We also, uh, there's only so much the regional center can do. If we do not have those resources, as Chad said, the Arc of California versus DDS decision, which is the centerpiece of the entitlement at this point, it literally says that the Department of Developmental Services has to go back to the state and basically say, either give us more money reduce the entitlement or eliminate it, okay? Anybody notice that the mental health system uh, has a lot less programs 
than the DD system? I mean, go to San Francisco, look at any corner, right? Why is that? And it has to do with the advocacy of parents and persons with disability. It's not because attorneys would like to see something different. It's not because professionals would like to see, see something different. They do respond to us when we do this in force. If we do not, we will have um, we will have waiting lists. We will have limited services, and we're going to see more burden on families. And we're going to see we are going to lose the promise of the Lanterman Act, which is to move not just to physically move people in the community. Because if that all we're doing is physically moving people in the community, but they don't actually engage in the community, what did we really do? And the answer is is probably nothing, right? This is really the full engagement of the Lanterman promise. And this is something because you you kids out there are a lot younger than me. This is something that's being passed on to you by parents in the past. And if we don't keep this up, the system will collapse. Sheridan, what do you got to say? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Steve, do you, do you want to cover any of these other slides or do you want me to kind of go through them? You have some great well, can, reference videos right there. I think the only right thing there. you have here is one of the handouts that you'll see. Um, and this is both if you sign on the YouTube channel, you uh, email Amy, there's there's an Amy right there at gspt.org, however you get it. One of the things that you'll get is a list of specific things in the training. So for instance, if you'd like to know about uh, here, um, about um, do you have to take the cheapest thing that comes along? You can go right to that segment here without listening to the full two hour program. Because part of this is it's meant to be a training, but it's also meant to be a resource so that when you get ready to do to do your IPP, here you've got the tools you need. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, and then once again, when you go there, there's also a playlist. So we have one segment out. The next segment that's going to come out, um, we settled on a date. I don't remember. But once again, you'll notice that uh, as we get into this, and I think this will build a little bit on what Sheridan's going to tell us, is the regional center alone is not the only player. So for instance, we have Tony Anderson uh, with the Valley Mountain Regional Center who talks about what is a, a regional center. We have, uh, oh, look at that. We've got this gal named Sheridan who's talking about what's a state council uh, here. We've got uh, uh, Jordan who's talking about what is the arc of California on a global um, advocacy range? And we've also got Bill Escher from the uh, Autism Society of San Francisco talking about advocacy for a specific group, which is folks with severe autism. Once again, these are all meant to be little education pieces to give you some idea about how all of these things work together. And I think that I hit the end there, I'm not sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I can't say enough. It's so important to check these out. You know, we all learn different ways and most of us benefit from having multiple learning aids at our side. So for some folks that's video and then some helpful publications or reminders about what their rights are. For other folks, it's having uh, people to call and to talk to or to email to get some technical assistance about their case or about their loved one's case. It's important that you have multiple elements and multiple ways that you can get support so that you can fully take take full advantage of the entitlement and your rights to get supports and services. And Liz and I are going to talk a little bit now to make sure you know about the state council and how we can be one part of your uh, of your uh, overarching plan of getting support. Um, there is a state council in every state and U.S. territory. Um, they are both in federal law and in state law, federally funded. We're an independent state agency. And we advocate and promote and implement policies and practices that achieve self-determination, independence, productivity, and inclusion in all aspects of community life for Californians with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And you can see here, the council is made up of 31 governor-appointed members. 
And 20 of those, you can see we have agency representatives, directors and designates from some of these departments that you see here. And then we also have uh, 20 members, 20 voting members who reflect the socioeconomic and geographic and disability and racial and ethnic and language diversity of the state. Um, and those governor appointed members are people with developmental disabilities or family members of people with developmental disabilities. So leaders from the community side by side with leaders from state departments and from um, other organizations, including the University Centers for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities, as well as the uh, Protection and Advocacy Branch, uh, Disability Rights of California, and CalSIBS, which is the California Sibling Leadership Network. So we have a, a rich network. And um, by the way, Steve mentioned earlier about attending a Regional Center Board of Directors meeting. Highly recommend that. Um, you, I also encourage you to sit in on a state council uh, council meeting. We have them every couple of months. And so the work at 30,000 feet, if we talk about California, so there's over 400,000 people with IDD in California that are served by the regional center system. But we at the state council, we're, we're focused on all people with IDD, including those under the federal definition that don't qualify for regional center services. So that larger population that we're talking about here in California is more like 100, um, 620,000 people with IDD. Most of those folks living in the community, a very small amount, um, under 150 people that are living in developmental centers or in um, state institutions. And the work of the state council is put together and over uh, uh, organized through what we call a state plan that we file with the administration on community living on a federal level. And so that includes everything from technical assistance for the community, trainings and support, serving on coalitions and committees, uh, giving out grant funding for promising practices and best practices across the state, as well as policy change and, and legislation change as well. And within our regional offices, because the state is so diverse and the needs are um, so wide across, across our great state, the state council has 12 regional offices across the state. So we can connect directly with the communities and work hand in hand with communities. So for example, I oversee the Bay Area Regional Office. So for our federal work, that's five counties. We also uh, provide some work on state specific contracts and serve many more counties out of our small regional office. And as you heard from Elizabeth earlier, she is the chair of our regional advisory committee for the Bay Area. Your regional office of the state council is a great place to reach out to, to whether it's to get some technical assistance and information about your rights, um, about services, uh, about generic services, um, if you're looking for more training or information on something, let us know. And, and we're also connectors. We also help connect people to, to positions and to ways that they can make a big impact in their community. Going back to what Steve shared, it's so important that all of us are involved in ways that make sense. And so uh, Elizabeth and I are going to give you um, some examples. We're going to talk just in the next 15 minutes or so about advocacy and some of your next steps of how you can get more engaged in advocacy, uh, both within the regional center system, as Steve mentioned, you use it or lose it. You either protect it or it's at risk. Um, and the same thing can be said for other systems of support across the state and across the nation. So, you know, we know what we heard is that California and the Bay Area specifically is the birthplace of a good chunk of the disability rights movement from decades ago. Uh, and it's been one of the nation's hotbed, hotbed of disability justice work ongoing since, since the 60s. And in these movements, folks with lived experience, uh, so otherwise referred to self-advocates or people with life experience with intellectual and developmental disability, hand in hand with family advocates have played very important roles in promoting uh, better systems for everybody. And that can be done in a variety of ways, personal advocacy or family advocacy, grassroots level advocacy, but also working within systems too. So having a position of leadership and working to change systems from the inside. Those are all um, in addition to other things like advisory roles um, and public comment, 
um, community feedback. Those are all different ways that we can have impact on the systems, um, both public sector and private sector, meaning both governmental and non-governmental bodies, all right? And then you heard a little bit from Steve about some grassroots coalitions and organized coalitions that made the change. You know, we have a lot of grassroots work to thank for the Lanterman Act. Um, and oftentimes grassroots coalitions may be multiple demographics, multiple communities working together on one key issue. Um, and some disability specific examples, you know, you think of people first, you think of the Lanterman Coalition, you think of some self-advocacy groups in our community, you think of the statewide self-advocacy network, Disability Action Coalition, Family Voices of California, Disability Voices United, DREDIF, FRCs, you get the idea. Many, many examples. Um, Elizabeth, what, what can you share in terms of the importance of different types of advocacy because different kinds work for different people? Thank you very much. Um, I am the really uh, I have legal problems. Many of you might say, all these poor things, it must be hard. Let me tell you, I have a great life. I live in my home. Pardon me, I have people cook, come in every day and help me out with my physical needs. How did I get my own apartment? I advocated for the right of me living in the community. Community. After my boss and mom passed away. Yeah, and yeah, like I said earlier, I worked for one of our regional centers, Golden Gate Regional Center. I get paid to work for them. As the rights advocate, I've been working there over 21 years. I also met this wonderful, fantastic lady named Sherry, who blew my mind, my first man. And she wasn't at the state council like she is now. But when I met her, we had the same mindset. How, how can we help change the system? Not for, not just for people with DD or IDD, even though they were great people. But we wanted to change for everybody with a disability, no matter what it was. And when Sharon got Sherry got the job with the state council. I, we kept working together as advocates. And when my counterpart, friend of mine, stepped down as the chairperson, as a regional council member, I I wrote Sharon and then I said, 
I think I want to take on the role as a chairperson. And we, we meet every couple of months and we have legislators come to the meeting. Yeah. And I want to highlight, you know, Liz, that part of your advocacy work is thinking about what roles you want in the system and what ones that you want in the grassroots work, right, to make change from different elements. So yeah. that includes for you, you know, working within the system, meaning you work for a regional center. Um, you also work within a system, you know, through the regional advisory committee of the state council, but you also do grassroots advocacy work, too. Yeah. Right. You, you you are a facilitator for people first, and you also are a member of other grassroots advocacy groups that are doing work uh, of and for the community. So making changes from different angles and in different roles. Yeah, it's huge. I don't know how many of you are parents with people with disability. And I, I know you, you you probably are just a thousand times. Oh, just let your child live in one of these developmental hospitals. They'll be okay. And the, they get their needs met. We'll keep them safe. But nobody ever said, how about letting the people with disabilities have a life? Nobody ever thought we were going to live this long. I'm happy to say I'm 52, fabulous, 52, and I'm, I'm still going strong for your yeah. loved ones on the regional level. People with disabilities need to be out there in the forefront. And oh, I just want to go back for a minute. Steve said something about the IPP. Don't sign nothing if you don't understand what the IPP is saying. Even if the software Seems like she or he is running out of time. Let them explain it to you over and over. Your IPP is like a living document. It sure is. Yeah. I would have to say, Liz, um, probably close to half of the calls and emails that we get to our office every week for technical assistance comes back down to either there isn't an up-to-date IPP, the person and their loved ones aren't sure what's in the IPP, or there's parts of the IPP they didn't understand or that didn't really make sense for the person. So a lot of things come down to that contract not being correct in one form or another. So it's important that that contract speaks to people's needs. Um, you can sign parts of it and not others. You can say, hey, we're not going to solve this today. We got to have another meeting to make sure that we agree upon this IPP. But if that IPP isn't speaking for your needs or your loved one's needs, then it's a bum contract. You got to get it fixed. That is your, it, you know, you've heard Elizabeth and Steve and I say it. It's, it's really crucial. And, and by the way, we can help you. If you reach out to the state council, we can send you more information or talk through some other components in addition to those wonderful video resources from Keeping the Lanham Act Promise that Steve was shared. So Liz, what do you think? Should we, should we go through a few slides to talk about policy change? Yeah. Okay. 
Um, let's just spend a few minutes and then we'll we'll transition to some Q&A at the end here. But important to know that whether we're talking about disability specific services or generic systems and services, they need to work, they need to be functional. And so you do have an obligation to monitor and to advise these systems. Um, Steve gave a great example that a lot of changes to the Lanterman Act and to people's services take place in trailer bills uh, towards the end of legislative cycles every year. If you don't know what's in there and you don't know what's being talked about, there could be substantial cuts or changes to the programs that you use. So important to, to be involved because we've all been in a position of having to live with decisions that are made when we're not in the room. Um, pretty important to know. And it's critical to know that the foundation of advocacy and systems change is education and educating policymakers, whether that's your assembly members, your state senators, your congressional leaders, or policymakers that are non-governmental, like your regional center executive directors, or your SELPA, or your school district. Um, those are other policymakers. So whether we're talking on a small level or a large level, you have to hold policymakers accountable. And that first step is to educate them about your life, your loved one's life, your experience, and what's working and what's not working, right? We call that the feedback loop. Um, that needs to happen not once, but often finding ways to make it sustainable. And Elizabeth and I, a lot of times when we were talking with community groups, like to share that data plus your experience times frequency, meaning not once, but multiple times, that equals advocacy for better systems and policies. So finding ways, and people can do this, whether you have half an hour, once a quarter, or whether you can devote multiple hours a week to advocacy. So, you know, you can make it happen. Uh, we all have very busy lives, but even if you just have a small amount of time, if you think about what is the system or the service of support that matters the most to you, you can probably get some support on how you can make an impact, even if you just have a little bit of time, right? And then prepping and, and getting some of that data together in your experience makes a big difference. Elizabeth, what do you want to share about that? It won't change unless we all change it. It's not going to fall in your lap. You have to be the squeaky wheel. To make the wheel turn. If you feel like no one is listening to you, not to your local legislative door and tell someone listen to you. Yeah. And some people don't know where they want to start. You know, they might say, gosh, there's a bunch of things that I would like to see work better for myself or for my family members. And so what we'd like to recommend is, hey, you got to start small, focus in on one issue to start. And then if you have the ability to bring to take on more than terrific, but you got to start somewhere. And so we'd like to recommend that if you think about some people in your life, yourself, your family members, loved ones, neighbors, community members, Think about what issues or topics, supports or systems or services impact them in their life. And then what ones also impact your life. And then think about what is the, the system or the department or the agency or you know the, the, what is in charge and related to that. And then talk through what that looks like in your, in, amongst your top five. That's a great way to start. And then we wanted to share this, which is a, a banner um, of people marching, um, holding a banner. And the banner has a quote from Naomi Ortiz, which is interdependence is survival. And that banner also says disability justice is racial justice is environmental justice. <laughs> and what that means is that rights movements and making systems better require us to be interdependent. We have to rely on one another and we have to know what impacts you that impacts me, that impacts my neighbor, and find common ground for us to stand together and to change things, right? And there's no one right way or wrong way, but that is a great place to start. 
and you have more in common with uh, with somebody next to you than than likely not. And for example, coming to events like this, this transition fair, is a great way to meet other advocates and people who are passionate. And think about you know talk to them d during uh, lunch or during other sessions. Find out how other people are engaged, and maybe you want to join them in some of that work. And, and then so once you go, I'm sorry, go ahead, Liz. And that is the way. It's all of us together. That's the only way this thing is going to work. You guys are getting older. Just think about. How would you want your life to be? People with disabilities, no matter what their disability is, they want the same right as everyone else. To live, yeah. to live in the restrictive environment to love and to be in love and to have autonomy no matter what it is they want to be a part of their community no more hiding away they gotta be in the forefront of every day. Yeah. And that includes being able to track the dollars, you know, understanding uh, whether you're talking about the regional center system or whether you're talking about special education or talking about uh, services that are other generic services in the community, understanding the flow of dollars, who's responsible, what advisory bodies or quality assurance bodies are in place. Those are all some great places to start when you think about where do we need your data plus experience times frequency, right? We're, we're, and equal um, equaling advocacy. And another great, great approach is to make sure that you have a relationship with your legislators. And it doesn't take much. It really just takes a few minutes to get those email addresses and those phone numbers and then to be able to shoot emails or pick up the phone and call when there are things happening that you want to make sure that your elected officials are working on on your behalf and your loved one's uh, behalf. And by the way, you know, this is a great link um, for certain bills that are in the legislative cycle. You can get updates regularly on those statuses to find out where they are in different committees. Um, call your legislator when there's votes that are coming up. So there's you know, this is a great place to get started and your state council is happy to help you uh, uh, brainstorm a little bit more about things that you can keep track of. And then uh, let's close it out and move to Q&A in a minute. But I think Elizabeth and I also wanted to share that in addition to legislative advocacy, there's non-legislative advocacy, of course, right? And so there could be, that could be attending and speaking public comment at regional center board mean, meetings or at self-determination um, committee meetings or attending a SELPA meeting, a special education local area plan um, meeting. There's 130 of those in California. So thinking about what you're passionate about, maybe a transit agency, a transit uh, accessible um, governing body if transportation is important to you or housing or employment. So many different opportunities there. And then don't underestimate the power of giving public comment and, and providing testimony. That is a key way that policy gets changed is by the influx of community members speaking to their experience and what needs to be changed in their community. So your experience is more powerful than many folks realize when it comes to providing public comment or testimony to policymakers or to advisory bodies. Um, and so I wanted to share, as we wrap up here, one of the things that you'll be getting is a handout. Um, let me go ahead and I'll 
I'll pull it up real fast just so that we can we can have take a look at that while we move on to question and answer. But please make sure that you take this handout before you leave because it's a great way to think about that next step that we talked about of um, getting involved. And so you can see here, let me move some stuff out of the way here. So systems overview for advocacy, it's as easy as one, two, three. It gives you some steps to uncover the system you wanna advocate within and then getting to know the flow of the funding and the accountability, and then how to identify your own personal resources of how you can make a difference, no matter how much or how little you think you have to contribute, okay? So we find that that's a, a helpful worksheet um, that can get you started in addition to talking with some of your community members and with offices like ours. And so kicking it back to Elizabeth and to Steve, uh, we might have some good questions in the room or comments or. Sure. Before we take the questions, let me just mention a couple of things and maybe we could do this as far as resources. I'm assuming that many of you folks are really busy and don't can't spend 24 hours a day advocating. And I don't think that's something that if you can uh, here, we could help you find committees and things like that. But many of us have limited time. So how do you keep up with all of this stuff? Because a lot of the system is pretty complex. And I am on the policy committee of the ARC of California. So we're looking at, you know, what's the legislation for next year? What is the issues and that sort of thing? And a lot of it has to do with funding, one of the least fun parts of this whole thing. And part of this is not only assessing it, but understanding it and trying to communicate. Now, I'll, I'll give you a couple of ones that maybe uh, Sheridan and Liz could give us their favorites. Uh, one of my favorites is a is a memo called the Monday Morning Memo, which comes out most Mondays, sometimes Tuesday, but it's Monday Morning Memo, and it comes out of the Arc of California. You can Google Arc of the California and sign up for it uh, here. And I would say um, uh, I'm not a fast reader. I think it takes me about seven minutes to go through it, right? And I can find the things that are important to me. But part of it in not only understanding what the issues are, but what are you advocating for? And when you need to get involved, the Monday morning memo is a really good way to keep in touch and it doesn't take an enormous amount of time. Now, the other one uh, here, and then I'll uh, ask them for things is, we have a developmental disabilities council. This just happens to be somewhat involved in putting this transition fair together. It's fairly unique. There's only two functional uh, developmental disability councils that I'm aware of, one's in Alameda, one's in Contra Costa. But this is where a lot of folks get together uh, here, leaders and advocates, and it's where we share ideas. And so whether you can attend or merely get on the mailing list, I think that's a good way to keep in touch with what's going on. What do you ladies think? Well, yeah, that's a state council office yeah yeah reach out to us we have a email list and can let you know of a bunch of places meetings to go to and ways that you can make a difference mm -hmm. including uh elizabeth's uh regional advisory committee meetings 
where you can meet a lot of legislative offices as well as other leaders in the area. And then also I want to give a plug for People First. People First is a oh, great yeah. way for folks to get involved. And here in the Bay Area, we have many People First chapters. So again, you can reach out to Elizabeth or to us at the State Council and we can get you connected. Any thoughts, any questions? Did we nail it? We should go home early. Oh, way in the back. You know, a lot of things in the disability community are 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 not um, intuitive. Like I get this all the time from parents who are new to the community. As Ed Roberts used to say, uh, the disability community is the community that does not discriminate. It'll accept any of us at any time. But it's the same thing as you're kind of learning about this, the whole process, the schools and all of that going along with what you're passionate about. Part of it is also being a teacher because, you know, part of it is teaching not only uh, policy makers and that sort of thing, but folks in our own community about what is this all about and and what is this community living and that's that sort of thing and why is this important? I know one of the biggest issues that I'm dealing with in because part of my job is to help uh, families find long-term solutions to provide for their child with a disability. Number one is housing. Number two is attendant care. The problem with the rates and that sort of thing, having meaningful rates, is when the rates for giving this care, which is probably, like I was a service provider at one time, I think serving the needs of persons with disabilities, I can't think of anything more honorable, and yet we pay them less than your barista, right? I mean, like, shouldn't we have a, shouldn't you be able to make enough to live in the community that you work in, right? And so why is it we're asking for more rates? For more funds and that kind of thing. Part of it is being passionate and being to explain to people why this is not just a giveaway. This is essential for quality community services. Any other passions out there? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Right. Sheridan probably knows a little bit about that. Yeah, our, 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 go ahead. Yeah, I'll give you Can I couldn't hear the question. She says they're they're very different depending on the regions that we're talking about. Like it might be different in Kern County than uh, Oakland. Right. So do regional centers have different budgets? They they do have different budgets. Um, and DDS and of course uh, the Lanterman Act dictate certain things that all regional centers have to follow. And DDS puts out what we call directives to regional centers of things that they want to be in line, things that they want to be the same at all regional centers. However, that still leaves a lot of things at the discretion of regional centers. So some things are the same, many things are different. That's both a feature and a bug. I say a feature because regional centers are supposed to be customized to their their community, their needs. On the other hand, that can be very frustrating if you know that your friend who lives 
one location is able to get X, Y, and Z from their regional center, and your regional center in a different geographic area has a different process and is more restrictive about X, Y, and Z. So it's, it's both an opportunity and it can be very challenging when you see discrepancies and differences. So part, part of the challenge right now is that being that we're in Alameda County, which is a pretty expensive place, is that, you know, how do we compete for that dollar? But the other part of that is that we have different challenges than, for instance, other regions have. And so this is a pretty complex situation uh, here. And, and I will tell you, rates are a big thing having to do with not only uh, the workers at the regional center themselves, where the turnover has been crazy uh, here. Yeah. And also, we're just starting to see a lot of the programs being able to hire. But it's not just hiring, it's retaining folks. Some of the vendor programs have had an 80% turnout uh, tur turnover annually. Could you imagine if you're running one of these programs, re re retraining 80% of your workers every year, and, and the the challenge that is, and also the effect that it has on persons with disabilities. If we don't communicate that to the decision makers, the policy makers in Sacramento, they're just going to move on to the next issue. We had a question in the back. Yes, ma'am. But it's lot, but. But here's the thing, just for myself, I am kind of a student of institutionalization uh, here. Partially, I grew up part of my life in an institution uh, here. And the thing about this whole thing, about the community services and that sort of thing, is that if we don't keep that up, like when a program shuts down, bringing that program back, it's not something you can grab off the shelf and just redo it again. This is why understanding the system is so important, not only the process through the IPP, but the whole funding pro process, because without that advocacy from parents and persons with disabilities uh, here, you better believe that we would be like the mental health system where there would be no system, right? And to think that's not going to happen, go to Texas uh, uh, here, and you will find folks with Down syndrome panhandling. I do I don't think we're going to get that far. But um, I'm, I'm, I am a force to be right here. I'm not going to let none of my, none of my community. Fall well, well, to the crack. I I speak up when people tell me I shouldn't. I do it anyway. Why? Because I care about people with disabilities. And we were we were told a long time ago, way before I was born, that people with disabilities were not going to amount to anything. We would never have a full, full normal life. The hell with that. We have a life of our children. Listen, listen. I'm here to say if you fight and you believe and your son or daughter have the right to live a good quality of life, then get out there and do your best to advocate. Advocacy goes a long way if you work it. If you just 
that there is feel bad and don't do nothing about it. Because it's not gonna work. But reach out. We're all here for you. And together we'll make it work. I have one minor thing I want to mention, and I think we're officially over, but we can hang here until that comes out and runs out of here. Um, here. Um, one thing is when you go back to the videos to take a look at it, you'll notice that it qualifies for credit for attorneys and trustees. I want to make this a little bit of a pitch. By the way, we talked down to the attorneys, don't worry, uh, here. Part of this is th there are many folks that are involved in this. So if you're working with an attorney who works with this community, or if you're working with a trustee or whatever, this does give credit. And here's the thing to think about. For, for professionals that are working with this community, they need to have an investment too. And quite frankly, if they don't understand what the IPP process is, how good of an attorney are they going to be if they're creating trust that supplement services they don't understand? So part of this is twofold as far as professionals are involved. And I, you know, once again, when we need them is one, we need to educate them and draw them in. And secondly, if you have sons or daughters that are looking for a profession to serve this community, professional care management, professional fiduciary work, and yeah, the occasional attorney uh, who works on disability rights is a very gratifying area to go. Part of this does give credit. And once again, we need our professionals to understand the service they're supposedly supplementing. But the more important thing here is that this is not a gift from the government. This is something that parents and persons with disabilities demanded. And if we don't continue that advocacy for real, and you, and you don't have to spend tons of time, we will become like Texas, where we will have a minimum amount of services, we will have waiting lists, and the whole dream of the Landerman Act will be lost. Last words, anybody? Just make sure and scan your after code and then you'll get electronic copies of this whole presentation and you can click on all the links. You don't have to type all this down or anything. We are officially over, but I'll take questions until we're done. Yes, ma'am. And there were other parents there and from other counties, and they had all these services, and I was part of the report, and then I was wondering why I would get pushed back here for not to get the services. That kind of clarified what I said for me, and then also um, this workshop and the previous workshop really helped me, like. Um, I know the you know, case manager and another person in there was supposed to be, have such a tool to talk about the kind of California because of the, the uh, price of living. They did their own research and was like, no, I cannot live in California because all my children's services that they need are here. And so they didn't go to Texas and some other places they didn't go. And so every time I, the last person I was in Florida, they used to be sold out like, even though California is whatever, but this is the place of my son. Because I can't imagine not having services for him. But there's two, I'd have two comments about the difference in services between regional centers. As Sheridan said, by design, they're designed to be different because the needs in a rural county is going to be different than ours. But as far as those services are concerned, and I see this all the time. Uh, is there's 250 possible uh, vendor code, something like that. I'm glad I'm not a vendor, right? But thanks. So it may be in some cases, somebody in another regional center are getting services that you don't think are available in your community. Sometimes the question has to be, why? Because if your child has that need, then it's the regional center's job to fulfill that. Sheridan, what do you think? 
Absolutely. Uh, you know, the, by design, regional center funded services are not supposed to be a menu that people order off of, right? Meaning yeah. that individuals and families shouldn't have to uh, go in knowing exactly what the code is and what it's called to get what their what their loved one needs. Uh, through the IPP process is when you're highlighting your or your loved one's needs, hopes and dreams, goals, challenges, the short-term wants, the long-term wants. Um, but if you feel like you're not getting um, that support from your regional center team, reach out, reach out to state council office, reach out to Disability Rights of California, reach out to an FRC, Family Resource Center, and get some guidance and get some uh, information about, about how to advocate and how to move a little bit more clearly and forcefully to, to get needs met. But it, it is difficult because it's not like ordering off of a menu, that's for sure. But there are some baseline categories and needs that, that you can know and should know, and we're happy to help with that. If we were that easy with you all, we would get out of here. And we have time for one last question. How about you? It's not a question, it's a comment. Yes. Last week, four months. So, not just Texas and Mississippi, even Washington State, which supposedly has two social services programs, no, not for what we're doing with developmental disabilities. So, we need to be thankful that we've got the money we got for California. I tried it there last week, four months. So the certain to... states may have certain things they have that they do better than California. None of them have an entitlement. Not for well, it's been, for instance, in, in New York, they have some really good housing programs, but they don't have the kind of support program we have here. Liz disagrees, but you know what? We're out of time. <laughs> anyway. Well, the pizza's better in New York. We all know that's true. So other than that, uh, five minutes, we're going to start a uh, special needs trust. Thank you so much, Sheridan. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.